are at Mount Vernon in the state of Virginia, where George Washington brought his bride in 1759 and made his home with her during 40 years of the most trying times in the history of a new nation, which was then being cradled. Washington inherited this estate in his early youth, and except for his absences as commander-in-chief of the armies of the Revolution and as first president of the United States, he lived here until the day of his death as a Virginia planter with all the stately and romantic traditions of the Old South. He died December 14, 1799, and his ever-devoted wife, Martha, joined him in death three years later. Their mortal remains now lie at rest in this simple tomb, not far from the house in which they live. Among the paintings that hang on the walls of the illustrious shrine at Mount Vernon are that of George Washington, painted in the final years of his life, and that of his wife, Martha Washington. This painting is perhaps the most famous of all that have been made to commemorate the memory of the man who was first in peace, first in war, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. To George Washington, the Freemason, this Masonic National Memorial Temple has been erected in Alexandria at a cost of $5 million, contributed by 3 million Masons. Outstanding among the many famous Virginians is General Robert E. Lee, who was born in this house on January 19, 1807. In the whole history of chivalrous warfare, no soldier has distinguished himself more than the man who once resided here. True to his native state, General Lee sincerely fought for what proved to be a lost cause. At Monticello, or Monticello, near Charlottesville, we visit the home of Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States and author of the American Declaration of Independence. This unique residence was designed by Jefferson, who also invented many clever devices which are still in use, such as dumb waiters, disappearing beds, and unusual lighting and ventilating systems. Although he had slaves on his estate who resided in these quarters, he was the author of the first American anti-slavery bill, which failed to pass in Congress. This serpentine wall, built on the grounds of the University of Virginia, is another invention attributed to the genius of Thomas Jefferson. It is built on a curved line for added strength and more artistic design. In 1819, Jefferson founded the University of Virginia, and here, too, we find evidence of his architectural skill. Not only was he the builder, he was the rector of the Board of Visitors, the administrator, and dominating power of the institution until the day of his death. Beautifully situated upon an elevation in Lexington stands the Washington and Lee University, endowed by George Washington and rehabilitated by Robert E. Lee, who became president of this institution shortly after the Civil War. Not far from here is the Virginia Military Institute, established in 1839 and known as the West Point of the South. Although the students are under rigid military discipline, they have their romantic hours of leisure. The Institute occupies nearly 40 buildings, of which the seven largest are furnished with battlements. The courses are designed essentially to train young men in the various fields of civic endeavor and military instruction simply augments the course of training. It was from this institution that General Stonewall Jackson, who was a member of the faculty, led the Corps of Cadets in 1861 to help train the Southern Army, which was then assembled in Richmond.
No story of the birth of a nation would be complete without a visit to Colonial Williamsburg, recently restored through the generosity and patriotism of John D. Rockefeller, Jr., making it a lively reincarnation of the busy and important colonial capital, which was moved here from Jamestown in 1699. The old courthouse, commendably restored, is now used as a museum. It was from this so-called powder magazine that the last British governor ordered the removal of public arms and ammunition, thereby helping to provoke the Revolutionary War in Virginia. The Bruton Parish Church is said to be the oldest Episcopal church of uninterrupted use in America. The governor's palace, completed in 1720, stood as a symbol of royal authority and prestige in Virginia, and was first the residence of a succession of men who governed the British colony for the crown, then served as the executive mansion of the first two governors of the Virginia Commonwealth, Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson, thereby sharing in the beginning of a dignified democracy. Social recognition at the palace was the near equivalent of acceptance at court in England. And the parties, balls, and entertainments here were probably more elegant and impressive than elsewhere in the colonies at the time. The governor's palace was the center of fashion and social life in colonial Williamsburg. In the restoration of the gardens, it was possible to employ methods of documentary and archeological research, similar to those employed in the reconstruction of the building itself. The restored capital is a counterpart of the original building, completed on the same foundations in 1705. The flag of Great Britain, now flying peacefully over this building, a copy of the obsolete flag of the 18th century, is a far cry from that day at Yorktown, when Lord Cornwallis surrendered his defeated British army here on this very ground to General Washington thereby terminating the Revolutionary War and establishing the United States as a free and independent nation. It is fitting that this momentous event took place in Virginia, the Old Dominion State, the boundaries of which once extended to the southeastern border of Canada and embraced what is now a dozen or more states, Virginia, where the Jamestown Monument commemorates a significant event in history, where the hardships and romantic adventures of the Jamestown colonists are perpetuated by statues of Pocahontas, the Indian princess who saved the life of Captain John Smith, the heroic savior of the Jamestown colony. Virginia, land of great men and great deeds, we salute you as the cradle of a nation. <laughs>